All right. So uh, in this debate format, I'm arguing the uh, more liberal side, the more progressive side. Uh, I should say that I have no disclosures to make relative to this presentation. But I think it's interesting, why are we even bothering to have this debate here? I mean, what is the issue? I mean, heck, why do we not let women eat during labor? Well, that can be summed up fairly succinctly in a single word, if I can get it to show. Aspiration. I mean, that's all this talk is about, really. So, but why are we worried about aspiration in this population? Let's, let's look at this closer. And I apologize in advance, because a number of the references that I used, uh, I actually invoked earlier today in my other talks. It's one of the disadvantages of giving all your talks in one lump here. Uh, and I hope I don't sound like a one-trick pony, but I think it helps make the argument uh, which I'm trying to make here. So. Really, the whole issue goes back to the single paper by Curtis Mendelson, which was published in 1946, Aspiration of Stomach Contents into the Lungs During Obstetric Anesthesia. He reviewed 44,000 pregnancies retrospectively at the New York Lying In Hospital, which occurred over a 15-year period. So remember, if this was published in 1946, he's talking about 15-year experience. He's going back in the 1920s to describe what's going on here. Now, he found that there were cases of aspiration, and this came to be known, not surprisingly, as Mendelssohn syndrome, and this is still the basis for our practice today. The report was actually divided into two parts, if you haven't read it, uh, the original. There was a clinical experience, and there was an experimental model that he presented. What was the clinical experience? Well, there were 66 cases of aspiration that he reported out of those 14,000 cases for an incidence of 0.15% about one in 750. There were two deaths, but he noted that both died of suffocation after aspiration of solids. They had eaten full meals at six and eight hours before operation. The interesting thing was, these were not all C-sections. In fact, very few of these cases were C-sections. Only 21% of the aspiration cases were actually cesarean deliveries. The remaining 79% were either normal spontaneous deliveries or they were operative ether deliveries. So clearly, something different was going on there than what we're used to doing today. What was that clinical experience? Well, they used general anesthesia for all of these cases, even normal vaginal deliveries, which was a mixture of gas, presumably nitrous, the report was not specific, oxygen, and ether mask induction and maintenance of the anesthetic with opaque black rubber masks which were strapped onto the patients. It was not clear from the report who administered the anesthesia, but you know, if you were there from my earlier talk, uh, you noted that a lot of times these were not anesthesiologists. And in fact, the specialty of anesthesiology had not even been born at that point. So what became the other 64 non-fatal cases that Mendelssohn reported? Well, almost all the remainder were liquid aspiration. How did they do? Quoting from the report, the actual aspiration often escaped recognition. Recovery was usually complete with an afebrile and uncomplicated course. Okay, so no harm, no foul. What about the experimental evidence here? Again, he looked at rabbits, much like Malinowski did earlier. Uh, in the earlier talk. These are pretty good-sized rabbits, five to six kilograms. And Mendelssohn introduced a variety of liquids into their trachea, gastric aspirates from his parturient patients, including solid, undigested food, hydrochloric acid, normal saline, water. What happened? Well, undigested food resulting in complete obstruction, OK? Uh, unneutralized vomitus or acidic solutions cause pulmonary edema, cyanosis, and death. Obviously, that's not good, but neutral liquids such as saline, water, neutralized vomit cause a result in a brief phase of labored respirations, but within a few hours, they were apparently back to normal. The interesting thing about some of these older reports that you read, uh, they include commentaries from presumed giants in the field at the time are, are learned professionals. And a Dr. Flagg, who practiced at some New York hospital, uh, it was not clear which, 
stated, this demonstrated the need for a pneumatologic service, I assume he means anesthesia, for administration, control, and monitoring of gases, as well as resuscitation and local anesthesia. Okay. His next comment was really interesting, though. It highlighted the need for a laryngoscope in every operating room and an anesthetist familiar with its use. Again, I just think this points out we're talking about a different animal than what we're dealing with today. Dr. Miller, who is from Hartford, Connecticut, uh, reported a series of 26,000 deliveries with no asphyxial deaths. Why? Well, they had a well-conducted pneumatologic service, unlike the New York City hospitals, and they had men skilled in the use of the laryngoscope. This was a necessity, or pointed out the necessity for a well-coordinated physician-controlled anesthesia department in control of all anesthesia and transfusion services. So they were really ahead of their time there. What conclusions can we draw from this? Well, first, inhalation anesthesia in and of itself, without intubation, for procedures in term pregnant patients is not a good idea. Second, opaque face masks with head straps for inhalation anesthesia are also not a good idea. Third, well, putting stuff into someone's lungs is not good. Duh. But what relevance does all this have for our current practice of obstetric anesthesia? I challenge you to show me a large series uh, of similar results. Why are we using this as the basis for our current practice today? This data is almost 90 years old. Haven't we made any progress? Yeah, we have, and it's time to reevaluate. In fact, this study has about as much relevance for our current practice of obstetric anesthesia as trephining does to the modern practice of neurosurgery. But what has changed? Again, we'll go back, look at where we are today. 4.1 million births, a C-section rate of 32%, 1.3 million C-sections, and we're doing a lot more C-sections, but again, not using a lot of general anesthesia. We're using a lot of regional anesthesia. We're putting fewer patients to sleep, and none for spontaneous vaginal deliveries, I would presume, except in a very, very rare instance. The result has been that the rate of general anesthesia for C-section has dropped dramatically, as I mentioned earlier. And this means only a small proportion of those 1.3 million C-sections are done under general anesthesia, 52,000 thereabouts in 2009. This contrasts with what we saw from Gibbs' original report, even back in the early 1980s or late 1970s, where general anesthesia was used in 41% of C-sections. So what else has changed? Well, when we do general anesthesia, we do it better. We pre-oxygenate, denitrogenate our patients. We use intravenous induction agents, uh, a mir miraculous advance. Uh, we place an endotracheal tube. And hopefully, we're all pretty skilled in intubation, the use of laryngoscopes, and even resuscitation. So we have come a long way. What about complication rates? What do we know about aspiration today and its incidence? Well, there have been a few studies. Again, we'll go back to the closed claim literature. Uh, I mentioned this study by Davies earlier. Uh, and they reviewed closed cl claims made by insurance carriers from 1990 to 2003 and compared them to a similar period from 1975, mainly through 1985. Their findings, well, the incidence of aspiration declined exponentially. In the earlier period, it was 4.2%. In the later period, it was down to 0.46%. And I would argue it's probably even lower today in our current practice. In fact, only two of the 429 claims in that database were for aspiration, and that's over a period of 14 years. Other evidence about what the incidence and severity of aspiration are, there's a study from uh, McDonnell and colleagues, this is from Australia, reviewed over 1,000 general anesthetic C-sections, which are done at 13 different institutions. Trainees performed over 70% of the intubations, so again, not the most experienced person in the room. 
And they had five cases of aspiration here. But if you read carefully beyond the abstract, what you find is that four were possible, and only one was actually confirmed. So even if we take those five cases and consider that to be the, the, the actual number that they found, that gives you an incidence of 0.4%. So if you apply that to the 52,000 general anesthetic C-sections in the US, that would mean a total of 260 possible cases of aspiration per year in this country. But that's only a small portion of the entire 4.1 million deliveries in this country. And we're asking all those patients not to eat because we're worried about those 260 cases. The overall incidence of possible and non-fatal aspiration in the U.S. would be around 1 in 15,000 odd deliveries. So we're denying all these pregnant women the opportunity to eat anything during labor based on a 0.006% incidence of a complication. So what is our real complication rate? Well, I've probably been too generous in this analysis. I probably, I'm probably quoting figures on the high side because there have been very few large serious prospective studies of this problem or any complication rate in anesthesia. And again, I'll, I'll invoke Dr. D'Angelo's SOAP score project here. Again, over 300,000 deliveries, 5,000 anesthetics for C-section, a 31% C-section rate, or 5,000 general anesthetics for C-section. Found a number of complications. We looked at some of these earlier epidural abscess, hematomas, neurologic injuries, failed intubations, postural puncture headaches. What was the incidence of aspiration in this series? Oh, it was zero, 300,000 deliveries. So the incidence of aspiration is zero out of 5,000 general anesthetics, but it's also zero in 96,000 C-sections and over 250,000 total anesthetics. So the incidence is actually so low, we're not even sure what the real incidence of this complication is. But I would point out, and this has been recognized by experts for quite a while, the problem is not oral intake during labor, it's substandard anesthesia. Back in 1955 in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Locke and Grice noted that although the recent ingestion of solid food probably was a factor in many of these deaths, Faulty administration of the anesthetic appears to be the direct cause of all except one. Commenting on uh, the UK's confidential inquiries into maternal deaths, Dr. Morgan noted a factor which is repeatedly noted is the frequency with which inexperienced anesthesiologists are involved in these disasters. But we all know that gastric motility decreases during labor. All these patients are going to be full stomach. Or does it? Roberts, way back in 1976, measured gastric volumes in 146 consecutive women delivering under general anesthesia. All these were intubated and, and such, more like our modern practice. He found that from the beginning of labor through over 16 hours from the onset of labor, measured gastric volumes actually fell. OK, that's an old study. More recently, Bataille, and I can't even pronounce that. But anyway, this was in a British journal in 2014, ultrasonographic evaluation of gastric content during labor under epidural anesthesia, a prospective cohort study. Serial measurements indicate that gastric motility is maintained during labor under epidural anesthesia. A direct quote from the manuscript. But we need to look at what's happening on the patient's end of things. What effect does fasting during labor have on our patients? Now, it's hard to find a lot of studies about this. There have been a few attempted, but they tend to be small and uh, <clears throat> not really well performed. So I'm making a leap here, and I'm comparing these patients to the fasting in another patient population we deal with, those undergoing general surgical procedures. Uh, this is a review from Nigren in Best Practices, 2006. And he noted that even brief fasting results in marked reduction in insulin sensitivity. And the metabolic response to surgery and other trauma involves increased metabolic rate in a state of hypermetabolism. 
and okay, I'm equating surgery and other trauma to labor and delivery, which I think is a stretch only in degree that we're talking about here. And he noted that although insulin levels are increased, blood glucose levels increase also due to insulin resistance. Increased release of stress hormones, catecholamine, cortisol, globulin, probably of importance. Increased levels of ADH, aldosterone. Besides the effect on the, the laboring woman, what effect does this have on the neonate? Well, avoiding preoperative fasting reduces postoperative insulin resistance by 50%. And oral supplements preoperatively actually may reduce infectious complications. I'm not going to press that one too hard. But are we really practicing evidence-based medicine here? A recent uh, meta-analysis, a Cochrane database systemic review on restricting oral food and labor during oral food and intake during labor, noted five studies, including some 3,000 women, which randomized the patients to either complete restriction of oral intake or some form of oral intake during labor. What they're able to conclude from these five studies was that there's no justification for the restriction of food and fluids and food in labor for women at low risk of complications. Are there any reasons to allow women to eat during labor? What do they think? Well, 30% of women surveyed by Armstrong stated that they wished they would be able to eat during labor. So it's, we're not talking about a huge percentage of the population here. You're talking about a subset. Singata in the Cochrane database noted that some women find this oral restriction unpleasant and sometimes even harrowing. I'm not sure how it would be harrowing, but that's what the conclusion they came to. So sometimes you just have to take a small step back and look at the evidence. And we evaluate what we're doing and why we're doing it. What else has changed in recent years? Well, heck, look at vasopressors, ephedrine. That was king for, for decades, and now it's pretty much verboten. We use phenylephrine. Preeclampsia, for decades, we would not do spinal anesthetics and preeclamptics. No, nah, heck, we do them all the time. Antibiotics, don't give those before delivery. You'll interfere with the neonatal sepsis workup. Oh, yeah. Put that one to rest. We use combined spinal epidural anesthesia for labor. Positioning, most recently in the, the an Journal of Anesthesiology, just a month or two ago, an article showing that even a 45 degree pelvic tilt did not guarantee you did not have cable compression. And certainly, at 15 degrees, every patient, and they were tiny patients, frankly, uh, had cable compression, even with that verified tilt. So, at this point, I would just uh, quote. Frank James, who was, you know, a longtime SOAP member, uh, might have been one of the founding members, uh, a great anesthesiologist besides being a great obstetric anesthesiologist, who wrote in 2012 that the saga of the transition from ephedrine to phenylephrine as the vasopressor of choice in regional anesthesia for C-section exemplifies the need, my emphasis here, to continue to question accepted therapeutic beliefs through additional animal studies and human investigation. Advances in monitoring and more sophisticated methods make studies possible. Now, in just a moment, you're going to hear a presentation from my friend and colleague, Dr. Siegel. And it's going to be a great presentation, because they always are. And it will be very easy for you to take his side in this argument. But I would ask you, before you do, step back. Look at what the evidence really is. Because the worst evidence is because that's the way we've always done it. So. Eating during labor? Sure, why not? Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I'm pretty persuaded after that. So, Scott, you've got your work cut out, I think, to try and persuade me otherwise. So, Scott's going to present us with a counter-argument, and then we're going to have some Q&A just for this pro-con debate immediately following Scott's talk before we move into Lisa's presentation. Scott. All right. 
Hello again, I find myself in a very uncomfortable position because uh, Craig characterized his position as the more progressive and liberal policy. For any of you who know me, it's not my natural inclination to be on the conservative side of pretty much anything. And even more disconcerting to me to be on the anti-eating side of anything. I'm, as a cook and a lover of fine dining and no less in a, a city with such an august Epicurean uh, tradition as San Francisco to be arguing against food it's hard for me. Um, it is, however, the only time you'll hear me making such an argument uh, when we're talking about women in labor. So let's go. Uh, do you want to let them eat, or should we stick to clears? I'm on the checkmark side of this debate, uh, and I'm going to try to tell you why. Now, I'm going to tell you what I will and won't argue. The first and most important thing is I was not this is not the 1950s or even the 1980s when I was growing up in anesthesia. Um, I am not going to argue that pregnant women, per se, are at increased risk of aspiration. I will not make that. I will make the other two arguments, that women in labor are at increased risk of aspiration, especially if we let them eat, and the supposed benefits of solid food are bogus both from a point of view of obstetrical and neonatal outcomes, they're really not different, and maternal subjective benefits, I'm going to argue, are minimal. And I think in a delicious twist of irony, I'm going to quote, and this is for you, Alex, uh, I'm going to quote um, the great rock singer Meatloaf. Meatloaf, get it? Uh, two out of three ain't bad. Two out of three ain't bad. OK, I'm going to actually make five specific points. First, women in labor, in italics, are at risk for aspiration. Second, solid food makes it worse. Uh, aspiration is still something to worry about. As rare as we have successfully made it, we should not retreat to a time when it wasn't so rare. Um, I'm going to show you that obstetric and neonatal outcomes are not improved by eating and that the subjective benefits are minimal. And you may actually see some of the same studies. Not surprisingly, Dr. Palmer and I see them a little differently. All right. Labor delays gastric emptying. Um, yeah, it really does. Uh, pregnancy does not. I do not treat second trimester patients or even near-term patients as full stomachs if they are properly fasted and not in labor, but I do think it labor does. Um, there's a number of ways you can measure gastric emptying. We're going to look at some examples of the first three, epigastric impedance measurements, acetaminophen absorption, and ultrasound. This is an epigastric impedance device. It's uh, kind of from an older study. The black and white photo is a clue there. You basically put electrodes around the epigastrium. Some send out a little current, some receive current. And if you eat or drink a non-ionic fluid, the change in impedance of sending that current across the epigastrium can be measured, and it correlates very well with gastric volumes. One of the biggest proponents of eating and labor from the anesthesia community, Geraldine O'Sullivan, um, who, who tragically died uh, about a year ago, um, did some of the early work using this device. Um, they measured gastric emptying in non-pregnant women, in women in the third trimester of pregnancy, but not in labor, and in the immediate postpartum period, that is, right after the labor period was concluded. And this is the um, epigastric emptying times. 30, 50, and 70 percent are the three bottom rows of 200, uh, 500 cc's of water uh, that was consumed by women. And the third trimester and non-pregnant numbers are exactly the same, but the postpartum immediately after the labor period are all increased. It takes longer for gastric emptying when you're in labor, or in this case, just immediately after the labor period. Um, that was one of the earliest studies. That was epigastric impedance. Now, acetaminophen uh, absorption is a really simple test. You give uh, the volunteer or the subject, 1.5 grams of acetaminophen um, at time zero, and then you take serial blood pressure, blood uh, levels um, after that, and you can measure, you can actually do it with salivary levels now, so it's not even invasive. Uh, you measure the, t the, the peak concentration of acetaminophen that you see, the time to the peak concentration that you see, or the area under the acetaminophen time curve, all of which is an estimate of gastric emptying because acetaminophen is not absorbed at all from the stomach, but it's absorbed very efficiently and rapidly from the proximal duodenum, so you know that the acetaminophen has gotten out of the stomach and into the duodenum. That's why you do it. What does it show? Well. Um, T uh, more than 20 years ago, Whitehead looked at non-pregnant women, pregnant women in each trimester, and then pregnant women in the immediate postpartum and second postpartum days. And what did they find? <laughs> Sorry. Um, they found no change in the non-pregnant uh, uh, 
or any trimester or the day after delivery. But in the immediate postpartum period, they found significantly lower peak, longer time to peak and area under the curve in the immediate postpartum period, right? So labor changes everything. Um, solid food slows emptying of fluid. So here's is a study, admittedly in male volunteers. These are acetaminophen time curves. Um, this is a group, that each, each subject did both uh, conditions. So this is a group that had only water, and this is a group that had water immediately after eating a cookie, and you can see that it, it delays it. One 400 gram cookie, not a big meal. Um, and 400 calorie cookie. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, it, it shifts the, uh, the, the curve to the right, meaning it's delayed emptying of the acetaminophen. Um, the third way you can do this in pregnant or laboring women is ultrasound, and you can take a sagittal plane view and measure the cross-sectional diameter of, of the stomach, and that can give you a pretty good idea of how big the stomach is, and you can even see solid food after a test meal. This is actually just to show you what it looks like. Um, this is um, consumption of water, 50 cc's or 300 cc's on the top row or the bottom row at 0, 10, and 60 minutes. This is in non-laboring patients, and I've sort of circled the, the outlines of the stomach to show you that at zero, it gets bigger after you drink the water and it goes back down afterwards, right? It's not that easy to see without my little red lines, but you can measure this. Um, now, many years ago, uh, CARP uh, and, and colleagues did this with a standardized solid meal. This was a big meal, 800 grams of food. That's a pound and a half of food, right? Fruit juice, muffin, roll, butter, jam, cereal with milk, and then they fasted. Um, in normal, non-pregnant women, zero out of 20 women had solid food at four hours. And that was also true at normal women in the final trimester of pregnancy, zero out of 20 at four hours. But normal pregnant women in labor, two-thirds of the patients had solid food in their stomachs, not after the test meal, just after whatever they had eaten before they were in labor, up to 24 hours later. Here's their actual data. So across the top, you have zero to four, four to eight, eight to 12, and 12 to 24 hours after the last food that they had eaten and you have the number of patients with food in their stomach over the total number in the next two rows. So six out of six at zero to four hours, six out of eight at four to eight, six out of 10 at eight to 12, and 10 out of 15, or more than two thirds of the patients overall had food in their stomach irrespective of when they ate. So solid food sticks around once you're in labor. Opioids that we give either in our epidural intrathecally or systemically make it even worse. So epidural fentanyl, 100 micrograms added to a plain bupivacaine epidural, slowed it further. Intrathecal fentanyl, 25 mics, was even worse than epidural fentanyl. And systemic opioids in the original O'Sullivan work doubled the time to gastric emptying versus no analgesia or plain ep bupivacaine epidurals. So almost everything we do in the labor process can even make it worse. Now, my, my esteemed opponent cited this study, but only cited a little bitty piece of it. Um, this is the Bataille study, this is out of Paris in 2014, used ultrasound at epidural placement and full cervical dilation, 60 patients. They established a cutoff value for at risk based on non-laboring women that they gave water to and looked at the size of the stomach, and they concluded that if, I'm sorry, it was orange juice. They gave them 250 or 240 mLs of orange juice and measured the size of the stomach that that created, with the argument being that would be enough to put somebody at risk of aspiration. Um, the, that cross-sectional area turned out to be 320 square millimeters, and here's what you see. So on the left, you see epidural insertion volumes, and the box plot there shows you the 25th to 75th percentile. And on the right is at full dilation. Now, these women didn't eat in labor, right? So if you leave them alone and give them an epidural, over time, they actually slowly empty and get down below that 320 millimeter squared uh, threshold. That's not necessarily true if you let them eat. And each of those little blue lines is, is one individual patient. So if you give them an epidural and don't let them eat, eventually things actually get safer, not less safe. All right. So we've talked about the first two points, women in labor at risk and solid food makes it worse. Now, I think we should still worry about aspiration. I think our remarkable success in reducing the incidence of aspiration is something to be proud of, not something to say it's not a problem, we can do whatever we want. I think we should applaud all of the things that we have done through increased use of regional anesthesia, more careful NPO guidelines, um, uh, uh, use of antacids, and so forth to reduce the risk that aspiration poses, not say, oh, never mind, it's not really a problem. So first of all, 
as good as we are at epidurals, and we talked a little bit about that earlier this morning, they sometimes fail, especially when you try to extend them for, um, uh, for, for cesarean sections. So um, Bauer concluded uh, that it, in a wide variety of a meta-analysis here of a bunch of studies, you may be lucky and be like uh, Dr. Geyser's institution there at the top and have a 0% uh, failure rate, but most of us have about a 5% failure rate, and that's the, the estimate from this meta-analysis at the bottom there, 5% failure rate. So you will sometimes have to do general anesthesia, and if you've just had them eating food because you have a cavalier attitude about oral intake, think about doing that in any of your other patients. You cancel cases when that happens, right? Why would we allow that to happen deliberately in laboring patients, especially because these are often emergency cases, which in and of itself is a risk for difficult intubation and aspiration. In that ASA closed claim study that Dr. Palmer also showed you, 23% of the cases for aspiration were actually in cases of regional anesthesia. So there weren't many of them, but the fact that we're doing regional doesn't always protect you from an aspiration risk. In a survey of, of anesthetic-related deaths, 23% of them from the period 1979 to 1990 were due to aspiration despite the growth in use of regional anesthesia. And in a more recent study by Jill Meyer, who we'll hear from uh, shortly at this meeting, um, of anesthesia-related deaths in Michigan, there were only 15, but one of them was an aspiration-related death, too. So aspiration has not gone away just because we've gotten better at it. So please, let's not get cavalier about aspiration just because we've solved the problem. All right, so that was point number three. Point number four, obstetric and neonatal outcomes. Now, this is very popular in the midwifery literature and in, in certain other lay birth literature, um, in certain women's advocacy literatures, and I don't want to say anything negative about that, but um, again, Dr. Palmer did my bidding for me here. There is no scientific data that obstetric or neonatal outcomes are improved by allowing women to eat in labor. Um, the largest randomized trial to date was done by the late Geraldine O'Sullivan and her colleagues in 2,400 healthy nulliparous women at term who have presented on the labor floor with a cervical dilation of less than six. And they were then randomized to water only or free intake of solid food. Um, if you look at this list, this is better than we're getting on the breaks. Fruit juice, soap, cereal, biscuits, fruits, chocolate, toast, vegetable stew, Danish pastry, sandwiches, burgers, chicken, and rice. And they called that light solid food. <laughs> Twenty percent in the water group insisted on eating anyway. So this was a group that, you know, maybe followed the rules, maybe didn't. And in the eating group, only 70 percent actually ate, and then only with encouragement. As, as uh, you heard in the first presentation, only about 30 percent of the women actually wanted to eat. They actually had to encourage them to eat. So this is not something that's universal that women are starving and feeling all this duress. Um, here's what they found. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Just look at the right side of the slide. The relative risk of all of these obstetric outcomes, normal vaginal delivery, instrumental cesarean, all are 1.0. No difference across the groups. Um, the number of patients that vomited uh, also didn't differ, so I'll admit that. But the number of women who needed oxytocin augmentation, the ones who got more fluids, the ones that got longer labor, nothing. No difference whatsoever. Didn't make a bit of difference. So this idea that it's going to make women stronger, that they're going to get through their labor faster, it's, it's a nice idea. It's just not true. Similarly, neonatal outcomes. So these are APGAR scores less than 7 or really low, less than 4, no difference. Admission to the NICU, no difference. Okay, so it doesn't help the mom's obstetrical outcomes. It doesn't help the baby. Here's a meta-analysis of five randomized trials. It's the same one that you saw only the conclusion of a few minutes ago, but I'm going to show you the data. Uh, Dr. Palmer told you to read more than the abstract, didn't he? So here's what it actually says. Here's the risk of cesarean delivery. There's one study favoring restriction. All the rest of them overlap the line of identity, and the overall risk, no difference. Instrumental delivery is identical, no difference. Low five-minute APGAR score, no difference. Other things with no difference, nausea and vomiting, maternal outcomes, the use of epidural analgesia or opioids, no difference, the need for augmentation of labor or length of the labor, no difference. In the only study that actually carefully looked at it in a full randomized trial, maternal keto acids, no difference, and admission to the NICU, no difference. So there's no real benefits of this in a material sense. What's What's the, the driver of doing this in the first place? Well, the last sort of ditch reason to argue for letting women eat 
is these sort of more subjective outcomes. And listen, we are all advocates for women health care, and we should pay ser serious attention to this kind of stuff. So I'm not trying to belittle any of this. But if you ask women, and this was in the O'Sullivan trial, and it was quoted in one of their abstracts, right? This is the one where they got 70% of the women to eat in this randomized trial. Only 30% actually wanted to eat. They had to push them. They had to push the rest of them to actually eat. No study has actually measured maternal satisfaction and reported results. It's just kind of this subjective feeling that some people have. And I would argue that allowing access to a variety of clear liquids, not just water or ice chips, but things like sports drinks, which was reported by Kubli in 2002, clear juices, possibly even special protein drinks that are basically water with dissolved protein and flavoring in them, reported by Manny Vallejo in 2013, will satisfy most laboring women. Liquids are good enough, is my argument. And I will say that vomiting may not be increased overall in the trials, but when women do vomit, they vomit a lot more stuff uh, when you let them eat. That's not surprising. That was even seen by Mendelssohn. And remember, it was the solid food aspiration that actually killed people. So it's the worst kind of vomiting if it does occur. OK, so these are the five points I made with you. Women in labor at risk for aspiration, and meeting solid food makes that risk worse. Aspiration, though rare, and we should be proud of that, is not something that we can forget about entirely, and it's certainly not an excuse to backtrack along the decades of progress that we've just made. Obstetric and neonatal outcomes are not improved by allowing people to eat, and the subjective outcomes, at best, are pretty minimal. So I could not say it better than this. Oral, this is a direct quote. Oral intake of solids should be strongly discouraged during labor, despite calls by some groups for more liberalized policies. Both the American College of Obstetricians and, Gynecologi of, and Gynecologists and the American Society of Anesthesiologists support only the oral intake of modest amounts of clear liquids during labor. Who could have said those incredibly profound and eloquent words? Where did I find it? I found it in this book <laughs> by Craig Palmer. <laughs> this is the easiest debate I have ever been in. No cake, not today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. That really was a killer talk. So um, we're going to ask the um, presenters to come back to the stage, and we're going to have a very short period of uh, question and answer session. So if anyone has any specific questions, about eating uh, in labor, please come up to the microphones that you can see in both of these aisles. And we'll try and afford ourselves a little bit of time just to run through some questions before we move on to the keynote lecture. Uh, how about over here? Jill. One of the issues that I don't think gets talked about a lot is uh, developing policy about what to do for patients being admitted for induction of labor. And in some institutions, inductions may take several days waiting for the cervix to become ripe. And at what point do you uh, institute whatever restrictions you might restrict? Well, you're right. This is, I would say, one of the diciest little things uh, to, to deal with. Um, I think in practice what happens is we use some definition of active labor. And once they're, quote, in active labor, then the more restrictive dietary policies come into play. Um, of course, one person's active labor is, you know, is, is, is different than another's. Um, typically, it, it's been four centimeters of cervical dilation with regular painful contractions, or quite frankly, once there's an epidural, um, because we may not be involved with the decision. I think it's a difficult issue because it's not really clear when the risk begins to elevate, and nobody's done those careful studies about very early labor versus prodromal labor versus active labor. Um, but typically, that's the definition that I've seen people use. Once you're in active labor, the more restrictive policies are enforced. How about you? To be honest, I'd have to go and look up exactly what the, uh, the guidelines are for those patients. A lot of times, they'll, when they're on the floor and we're trying to get them in, into an active labor pattern uh, during the day, uh, you know, they'll be restricted for oral intake. When they say, oh, okay, that's enough for today, I'll come back tomorrow, then they'll let them eat dinner and, and they'll do it again in the morning. So you have this sort of episodic interruption of, uh, uh, of eating habits or whatever. But I thought that was interesting that Scott said, well, 
you're allowed to eat up until four centimeters. So you, you can eat during active labor, I guess. But uh, the interesting thing about some of these debates is just because you debate one side of it doesn't mean you're married to that point of view. Clearly, uh, clearly not. <laughs> clearly not. But I, I do think that being forced to take the side in the debate, you know, opened my eyes to a lot of uh, gray area in this entire practice. And I think that, like Dr. James said, you know, you need to keep looking, you need to keep asking the questions, you need to keep uh, perhaps changing your mind. And uh, if solid food is not the something we want our patients to to be eating, you know, certainly some, you know, restriction, you know, ice cream, yeah, cookies, sure, why not, whatever, you know, that sort of thing. So I think there is room to, to hedge on this a bit. Okay, I think we're going to move to this lady on the left here. Yes, in the past over two decades that I've been practicing, I've seen a change in the obesity rate. Could you all please comment on that and how that impacts what you have to say? Well, I'm going to take Craig's side on this one, I think. Um, obesity does not affect gastric emptying. Um, I think it's a myth that obese patients have impaired gastric function. They don't. Um, and, and I used to sort of joke with my residents, that's how they get to be obese, right? I mean, the, the, they, they handle food just fine. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that there's good evidence that that worsens the risk. On the other hand, it certainly worsens airway management risk and may increase the failure rate for regional anesthesia. And so even the ASA guidelines sort of say more restrictive policies may be indicated when, and the, I think ACOG even agrees with this, that more restrictive policies may be indicated when you think there's a greater risk from an anesthetic point of view. So I wouldn't put it from the point of view of their gastrointestinal function so much, but the rest of anesthetic management. Uh, I'll, I'll agree with Scott around about the issue of, of obese patients, but uh, when you start invoking the, the ASA and ACOG guidelines, uh, I'll even go further than, than Scott, you know, noting that that was printed in a textbook I had a hand in. I was the, the ASA's representative to the ACOG committee at that time, and I, I literally wrote those guidelines. So <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse than it sounds. But, but nobody... Nobody will ever accuse the ASA and ACOG of being progressive, forward-thinking organizations. So you have to take that into account when you're, you're judging those guidelines. But. All right, so I think we have a question now over here. Hi, Erica Grant from University of Texas, Parkland. Um, I had a comment about early versus active labor, like the young lady there is just making a distinction between those. I think you guys have answered that. But my question is about the protein drinks. How do you feel about that? Because we know with colorectal sur um, surgery, they're moving forward with the hands uh, recovery after surgery, and that's becoming very popular. What, how do you feel about it in, obstetri in obstetrics? So I'm aware of one study of this in laboring women. It was done by uh, Manny Vallejo when he was, I think, still at Pittsburgh. And um, they, they randomized them to water or this kind of enhanced protein shake stuff. So it's not a clear liquid in the sense that you can't see through it. Um, but if you look at the ingredient list, it's almost all water. And it has dissolved fine granular protein in it. They did not measure gastric emptying or gastric volumes. They just looked at maternal satisfaction and some metabolic indices and said they were better. So I think it's too early to really say during labor. I fully support the idea of energy providing and protein providing drinks both in the pre-surgical and enhanced recovery periods. Fortunately, most women recover pretty well after cesarean delivery, and I'm not sure that the benefits are going to be as great there, but I love them for other purposes. I think it's a little early to make a judgment about labor. I would just say that this sort of highlights the, the dearth of data that really addresses this specific patient population and the issue that we're talking. You know, we're, we're both trying to extrapolate from different studies to the point we're trying to make. Uh, and clearly there's a, a wide open field here for somebody who has the uh, time, energy, and resources to, to really address this. So. Thank you. All right, so I think we have just time for one more question. So I think um, if we can keep it short and the answer's short, that'll be great. This should be quick. Um, can you comment on the routine use of oral bicitra prior to C-section? 
when I was uh, reviewing literature for this, uh, there was uh, a sense in the literature that during labor, and I, are you talking about prior to C-section or specifically or during labor? C-section. Okay, well, I think the sodium citrate can be effective at increasing uh, pH in many, probably not all women, uh, and, and it might be a useful uh, and is a, a useful adjunct for uh, cesarean anesthesia. During labor, there's no evidence that administering antacids during labor provides any protective or uh, beneficial you know, result for those women. So. I'll stick my neck out and take the more liberal side. The idea of giving it before elective cesareans and non-laboring healthy patients is a holdover from the idea where we used to think that all pregnant women were at risk by Mendelssohn criteria. Mendelssohn criteria are number one bogus. And number two, uh, pregnant women at term presenting for cesarean section are no more likely to be quote, quote, at risk than fasted healthy outpatients who you do not require to have by citra. So my own feeling is if they don't want to drink it, I don't make a federal case out of it. Because it's sort of a tradition in most places, it usually gets given before I even get there. Um, but if somebody's having trouble with it, I willingly omit it. So you could do, do those elective C-sections under general anesthesia with an LMA then, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Great. everyone. Thank you very much, guys. So on that note, I think we're going to call the council to close. Okay.